please hold while I say got that, got it. So at this time, there's no capital money in place to, to make improvements, although we have made a capital budget request for the playground replacement for fiscal year, for the next fiscal year. So this is our second of three planned public meetings. At our first public meeting, Luke Buttonweiser from the City Transportation, Traffic and Parking Bureau attended our first meeting last January, and he reviewed all the user surveys that we had collected. Many of the concerns centered on traffic and parking issues. And so Luke's department decided to get involved in adding to the scope of our project. They, they enlisted the Traffic Engineering Division of Beta to look into parking and traffic improvements on Burdick, Upland, and Belltown, which we'll be hearing about tonight. I will introduce the beta team, but first, um, Luke, do you want to say a couple of words about your involvement in the project? Yes, thank you, Aaron. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Luke Buttonweiser. I'm with the City of Stanford Transportation, Traffic, and Parking Bureau. Very happy to be here tonight. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I was on the first public meeting, and at that meeting, we heard a lot of concerns from the community specifically related to mobility and transportation concerns. Um, so at that point, our department decided to take a bigger role in this master plan improvements project. Um, and we were just speaking with Erin, it's really her, de her department's working on improving the park itself, but it's important that there's good access to the park. So it's easier for people to walk to the park, especially in this neighborhood um, where there's a lot of people are walking. So my department is really taking a look at this area based on citizens' uh, feedback and try to improve the overall mobility and connectivity of the park to the surrounding neighborhood to really make it, most importantly, safer to get to the park and then also easier to get to the park. Uh, so we're looking forward to presenting what we've talked about, uh, what we've developed for you, and hearing your feedback as well. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce the beta team. Um, first, Nate Sosho will be taking us through the presentation. He's a landscape architect with Beta. Randy Collins is the principal landscape architect. And Jason Wime is the civil engineer. He's on the traffic engineering side of Beta. So I turn it over to Nate. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate everyone taking time out of their evening to um, join the second presentation. Um, real quick on project schedule. Um, we are here um, on the second dot here, the second community meeting, as Aaron mentioned, and um, we are going to be showing some concepts for both the um, roadway, the park, as well as the playground improvements. And um, through this process, we hope to um, uh, do uh, one of these three, do each of these um, three areas of um, study and uh, pause for questions and comments before we move on to the next one. And then after that, we hope to uh, finish up with just uh, general questions and open up the discussion for any other thoughts. And then we'll have some closing remarks and next steps. Um, quick on the meeting protocol, we're asking everyone to remain muted until um, the pause at each um, segment of the presentation, whether it be the roadway, the park, or the playground, and to keep uh, questions for um, uh, at each segment um, based on the um, work, um, whether it be the roadway, the park, the playground, uh, within that, that realm. Um, real quick on our approach to park design, um, we see it as a combination or a balanced effort of the goals of the city, as well as um, safety and regulatory guidelines, as well as community input to get a balanced um, design of meeting everyone's needs in the middle. And the project goals, um, for the roadway improvement plan, we see it as traffic and pedestrian improvements of Burdick Street, Belltown, and Upland, as Luke mentioned. Um, for the park improvement plan, what we're really looking at is upgrades to the existing buildings, including the pavilion, the park building, and the baseball facilities, as well as reviewing site circulation, upgrading the stone walls, and considering new park features. And last, the playground improvements. Um, the goal is to develop a new playground, including a two to five and five to 12 play areas. Um, with appropriate surfacing, um, make sure there's adequate grading and drainage within that play area, and then if appropriate, site fencing. 
So I'm gonna turn this over to Luke and Jason to talk about the roadway improvements. Thanks, Nate. Um, hello, everyone, again. <laughs> As I uh, mentioned before, we want to look at this uh, project holistically, right? It's not just about the park and what goes on in the park, which is very important, but we can do a, make a great park, but if people don't feel comfortable getting to that park, then it's a little, um, it's, you don't get the full potential of the park realized. So based on the citizen concerns um, from the neighborhood, and our department was actually looking at some improvements on Belltown Road previously, we really focused in and saw there are a lot of concerns related specifically to Upland Road slash Belltown Road, as well as Burdick Street. So um, we could, that's how we scoped the project generally is based on where the majority of the citizen concerns were. Um, what framed our designs was really the most, what I heard was the biggest concern was the speeding on Upland Road. So as part of this project, we actually collected some traffic data and we found that the 85th percentile speed on the road was 35 miles an hour. Um, and it's a 25 per mile per hour speed limit. So this definitely demonstrates an active speeding concern on the road. And that's something that we take very seriously. We want to address with this, the design. Um, there were sight distance and sight line issue concerns um, that we heard about, we tried to work on, as well as general pedestrian safety and mobility concerns like crossing the street didn't feel very safe, a lack of crosswalks, lack of sidewalks. Um, so that's really important. We really try to. Um, Thanks, Nate. Um, so when we when we design roads as a department, we really are, we're take a safety first approach. Um, you know, everyone we do not want serious injuries on our roadways. So we really try to make roads as safe as possible, focusing on the most vulnerable users, which are pedestrians and uh, bicyclists. And then once you make roads safer for them, they become safer for everyone else. And it's more comfortable for people to walk, to bike, to really get around in a much more um, sustainable and equitable fashion on our roadways. Um, so that's why we really wanted to look at the speeding and the pedestrian concerns. But then on Burdick Street specifically, there were parking issues we heard a lot about. I know I've personally witnessed that myself. Uh, maintenance issues on Burdick Street, you can see in the photo on the right, there's some pooling and puddling. Um, kind of a lack of defined parking area in the roadway itself, and also just general concerns uh, with the parking lot. So a lot of different things to, uh, for us to look at when it comes to mobility around Barrett Park. Um, but, you know, I think we, we took all these concerns and really applied them to what our proposed and uh, design interventions are. Um, so Nate, if you want to go to the next slide, we can jump into that. Um, so this is kind of just an overview. It's really kind of three sections. So we have the Belltown Road section in the, kind of the commercial area. As I mentioned before, our department was looking at this area before this process even got started just to really kind of support the, this unique uh, commercial area where, where Belltown Pizza and Freshco is. Um, so that's kind of one section there. And then there's the Upland, the Upland section really connecting the uh, neighbors to the east to the park. Um, and how to control the speeds on that road and improve connectivity and mobility for pedestrians in that section. And then there's Burdick Street, which fronts the entire park, as you well know. Um, and there's the challenges related to the parking concerns on the road, the speeding concerns on that road, just kind of narrow width on that road, pulling out of the road onto Belltown and Upland, and also the parking lot that's right over there, issues with people. Um, you know, some undesirable activities occurring in that parking lot and just issues with general visibility in that parking lot. So um, Jason, who uh, was introduced before as a traffic engineer from Beta, we've been working closely with, he can kind of go into more specific design interventions that we've discussed that will directly, and we hope will directly address the concerns that we heard from the neighborhood. Um, so now you wanna to run to the next slide. Luke, I appreciate that. Um, um, so I just want to voice exactly what Luke was talking about. I mean, we're basically focused on reducing vehicle speeds and improving the pedestrian access uh, to and from the park through various um, neighborhoods um, in the area. So what I'll do right now is just focus on Belltown Road. Um, so there's several improvements that we've been trying to implement um, in this area. We know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, businesses and residential uh, properties adjacent to uh, to the roadway that we want to make sure that are enhanced and that we're improving vehicle and pedestrian safety through the area. Um, so one of the things that we had done is um, basically trying to in introduce um, some sidewalk bump outs um, at the corners of Belmere Avenue and, and Leonard Street. 
Um, the reason for this is to improve visibility at the crosswalks. Um, at the same time, it also reduces the vehicle speeds by narrowing the roadway width. So, um, you know, those are, those are uh, accommodated at, at both Belmere and at, uh, Leonard Street. Um, so in addition to that, if we're gonna be incorporating bump outs, um, we wanted to do something that really just enhanced the area a little bit. Um, we wanted to improve what the sidewalks uh, look like, uh, the conditions of the sidewalk, as well as adding some, a little bit of accents with brick banding, maybe as, uh, associated with some new, uh, you know, granite curbing, reconstructing some of the driveway aprons um, in the area. So if we're gonna be doing these improvements, it's, it's a holistic improvement, they're not spot improvements. We wanted to make sure that we're looking from, you know, looking at the whole entire block from Belmere to, to Leonard Street. So this is obviously gonna enhance, um, you know, the areas in front of the local businesses. It does attract a lot of people that are going to and from the park in this area. Um, and it's gonna improve uh, safety and visibility. The other thing is that we like to, to incorporate as well is having a little bit more organization to the on-street parking. Um, I don't believe that they have any stripping up there today, but I think it would be nice to enhance that to just promote um, on-street parking, you know, narrow up the travel lanes a little bit and improve the safety um, through that area. So after that, we can move on to uh, Upland Avenue. So some of the goals for Upland Avenue also include reducing vehicle speeds, um, but at the same time, you also want to improve pedestrian access into the park as well as along the park. So Upland Road is fairly wide. Um, there's, there are currently no sidewalks along the western side of the roadway adjacent to the park. So you know we saw that as an issue. We thought we, we thought about a couple of things that we could introduce to the project to to enhance connectivity and reduce the speeds, um, vehicle speeds through the area. So one of the things that we wanted to do also, which we also did on Belltown, is let's let's narrow up the roadway. The roadway is fairly wide. We have the opportunity to move the curb line adjacent to the park further into the road. So not only are we able to narrow the roadway, but this also allows us to provide a, a new sidewalk along the west side um, for connecting, you know, pedestrian the park or from from street to. Uh, um, same time, you know, we, we had some challenges on, on how we how do how do we how do we do that because we have some existing concerns along that roadway. We know that we uh, existing stone walls. There are several trees along that roadway, um, and and some other concerns that we had. From we had the opportunity to to like I said, move the curb into the roadway, have an opportunity to construct a sidewalk, preserve the preserve the walls. And we also have opportunities to um, provide additional access points. So as you've seen here, we've had got several crosswalks um, or just sidewalk locations into the park. Um, one of the looks shown on the plan is, a, is an all-sock location gap in the stolen wall as an opportunity to provide either ADA access and, and pedestrian access into the park. Um, so it's lend itself fairly well to, to the new park. Um, uh, on the on the west side of the road. Um, there's a number of other things that have uh, incorporated to Upland Street to help reduce the vehicle speeds. Those being not just mobility crosswalks, but raised crosswalks. So uh, it really does prioritize pedestrian in the air. It really does slow traffic. Um, those are two things that have always been very uh, well received in the past communities. Um, and we've also looked at producing um, median, for instance, at the existing bus street. Um, so this would most likely slow down traffic quite a bit on bound and southbound uh, legs of that intersection. So this could be done concurrently and or with the raised crosswalks, depending on how things are. Um, but we know that vehicle speeds were concerned, so we wanted to go and actually propose um, several methods and options to the public um, that would alleviate these issues. Um, and final, I just, go ahead. Sorry, um, this with Upland and Belltown, we also wanted to look into gateway treatments to the neighborhood. So really some placemaking. We know that coming up um, Upland from Strawberry Hill, you're really entering Belltown proper right over there. Um, so we really wanted to define the entrance to the neighborhood by slowing the speeds down. So raised crosswalks are basically crosswalks, but they're even with the sidewalks. So they're almost like big speed humps. Um, it makes it easier for ADA compliance for anyone pushing a stroller. Um, and then the, 
the raised uh, planted median is kind of um, it's planted. We're trying to connect the road to the park a little bit, almost like in a parkway setting. Um, so, and those are just kind of the gateway neighborhood level treatments we wanted to, um, that we thought about too, is including in these designs. Sorry, Jason. No, that's okay. No, I appreciate the input. Um, so from here, I'd like to talk about Burdick Street. Um, there's quite a bit of concerns on Burdick Street. They seem, some of the concerns are synonymous with the other roadways that we've already discussed. Um, so most of them are basically reducing vehicle speeds, providing additional parking and improving the, the pedestrian access um, into the park. We've heard reports of a lot of people um, coming around Newfield Avenue onto Burdick Street at high speed. So we're, we're trying to implement a lot of different um, elements to Burdick Street to really reduce the traffic. Um, some of the things that we've con considered doing is, again, reducing the roadway width in areas that make sense. So, for instance, at the intersection of Newfield Avenue and Upland Avenue, um, those two areas would be to, you know, narrowing the roadway. Um, but we got to be careful because we've also heard um, that we really want to provide additional on-street parking. So, as Luke pointed out before, there are people that are parking on the side of Burdick Street, but it's not well defined. There's no curbing there. The drainage is really poor. Um, so we're looking to enhance that. So we're, we're definitely going to take care of the drainage concerns. We want to put in granite curbing. We want to make sure it's safe for people who are parking there to, to get out of their cars, to access a sidewalk, which I'll discuss in a second. Uh, but getting back to the on-street parking, um, we're trying to utilize as much of on-street parking that we can on Burdick Street, but at the same time have certain sections that are narrow to, to reduce vehicle speeds. So one of the areas I like to talk about first is providing on-street parking uh, prior to uh, the Northern parking lot. So um, Burdick Street is one-way street. Um, it's one way from Newfield to Upland. So we've, hit, we've also heard a lot of concerns. Well, you know, there, there was a a desire for on-street parking to be provided just prior to the parking lot. Uh, there's many benefits to this. Um, I know a lot of parents tend to drop the kids off to the park um, and then just want the opportunity to go ahead and utilize the parking lot, um, which you really can't do today. Um, you have an existing stone wall that's close to the roadway. The drainage doesn't allow that. So we wanted to, to, to provide as much on-street parking prior to that, to that parking lot as possible. Um, and we're also gonna do the same thing um, for the majority of, of Burdick Street. So um, currently we're proposing a, a bump out, just basically across from the entrance to the Northern parking lot. Um, what that will do is that, again, it'll reduce vehicle speeds, it's a pinch point. Um, the road is narrowed at that location, but it also enhances visibility for pedestrians and a crosswalk, as well as a gateway into the park from the Northern parking lot. So we thought that this was a great um, uh, opportunity to provide any kind of signage, wayfinding, into the park, visibility, crosswalks, you know, vehicle speeds are reduced, pedestrians are prioritized at the, at the location. Um, and again, east of that location, you know, we, we want to provide as much on-street parking as possible. Um, and then making sure that as we approach the intersection of Upland Avenue, that we're again prioritizing pedestrians and narrowing up the roadway and reducing the speeds at that location. Um, so that's basically what I have to say about Burdick Street. Nate will uh, now talk about either the, the park improvement plan as well as, as the parking lot on the north side of Burdick Street. Actually, we're going to take a, a pause right now and sure. um, have people have the opportunity to ask questions about the transportation, parking, and um, roadway improvements. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> I think we're trying to use the so, all right, Jesse, you have your hand raised. And I'll go to Reagan after. Thank you so much. Um, that's fantastic. It's it's so great to hear how well you've thought out everything. Um, I have a couple of questions. So my first is why, based on everything you've explained, how come the Strawberry Hill and Newfield Street, that, that side over there, was excluded from this component of the plan. Um, there is There are non-ADA compliant sidewalks on that side of the park and have been an issue that we've been working with the city on for years. There just hasn't been city budget money for it, but it's like a recognized huge problem there. I live on the side so I can speak to it personally. Um, additionally, there is a crosswalk that leads into the main entrance to the, or one of the main entrances to the park on, right where Newfield and Strawberry Hill hit. Um, that crosswalk is extremely dangerous. We've done a lot of testing on the traffic department about it. And now we have what is most likely the most advanced 
crosswalk that we could have with blinking lights, et cetera. Um, two weeks ago, I witnessed a huge accident there involving pedestrians. Um, it's so dangerous. I think that having an elevated crosswalk there would be fantastic. Um, so I, I would really like that to be evaluated and thought through to possibly make part of the plan in addition to the sidewalk issue that's over there. Um, and um, my other point is on the Upland Avenue side, I noticed when you brought that up in your slide there, you said a crosswalk would either be placed at the end of it or in the middle. It was like you wrote alternative. Um, I think a crosswalk belongs in both locations. That's a very large stretch to not have a crosswalk in the middle. Um, and uh, Lastly, for the, yeah, right there, exactly. So you wrote crosswalk location alternate. I think that you need all three crosswalks. That and, and that's, and actually that's what it was intended to be. It's not oh, an okay. alternate, it's not sure an it alternate, was. it's whether, the alternate is whether we put it in, in conjunction with the other two. Oh, got it, sorry. Okay, sorry, awesome. No um, and then um, my last one was going back to your, the next slide, the, up, the Burdick one, I didn't see crosswalks on here. I see the one that we talked about right in the middle, but I don't see one on the Upland side. I see one across Upland, but I don't see one across Burdick near Upland. Um, and I personally cross right there all the time. And um, I think that's just important. So um, those are my key points. So. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll be happy to take all those. So um, I'll go kind of back. So the, I think the crosswalk is existing there at um, Upland and Burdick. I just think is probably just the rendering of the design. Um, just maybe didn't show it, but it's there existing. We're going to keep it there. Um, I think Randy pointed out your, and answered your second question related to the uh, crosswalk on Upland. We're definitely um, looking to um, more, you know, we're generally supportive of like more crosswalks, right? We want to get people easily to the park as much as possible. And then in relation to your first question, um, we based these designs off really the majority of where the concerns were coming from, from the neighborhood based on the first meeting. And the biggest things we heard were concerns on Upland, um, uh, Belltown and Burdick Street. And those roads are really similar in terms of like their typology and their not to get too technical, but the roadway classification um, where you can do certain things on those roads in line with national guidelines, such as raised crosswalks. So Newfield Avenue, as we all know so much, I live on Newfield personally myself, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, much busier road sees higher volumes. It's considered to be an arterial road um, and raised crosswalks wouldn't, um, and speed humps aren't really appropriate for those types of roads. As you mentioned, we do have the uh, RRFB or the flashing um, push button lights over there. Um, I'll be happy to take a look at the sidewalks. I do believe they were reconstructed and somewhat recently. One, um, one side there. of the street was and the other side was not. And the city okay. knows that it's an issue. Okay. I know that the city has been, um, especially the new administration has been really looking into improving um, sidewalks. So I believe our budget just ballooned to like $2 million. Um, it is focusing around schools right now. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we don't have too much um, uh, capital money really supports for this right now. Um, but if the city is aware, I'll, I'll check back in with our um, highways department and they kind of handle the updates to um, the sidewalk, uh, reconstruction of the sidewalk. But basically just to frame uh, your point is that we, when we scoped the project, it was based on the citizen concerns from the first meeting. And those concerns were really based around Upland, Belltown and Burdick Street. Um, and I, I also okay. think that just to, sorry to interrupt, Jesse, the, uh, the, the, the sidewalk on the park side of Newfield really is in consideration. It's considered as part of the park project. We've been looking at that and know that that sidewalk needs to be addressed. So that sort of is part and parcel to what we were doing with the park itself. Okay, thank you. I appreciate no, it. Um, I just want to. I just want to add though that like I I managed um, receiving a lot of those responses from the initial forum and the meeting and I know that there were significant complaints about the crosswalk there and you just you can see another one that just popped through the chat now um that I, I think that's actually a, a massive massive issue that we have here it's so dangerous there are so many accidents there it, it's it's really crazy that people don't stop for that that light there and that's a prime access point to the park so mm -hmm. I'll just no and you yeah. mentioned there was a crash two weeks ago so I'll be happy to get that crash report um, and look into the crash history as well. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Regan Allen. I live on Belmere. 
avenue. Um, so I love this plan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I especially like the sidewalk um, on um, Upland on the other side. That's really gonna help a lot. Um, I really also, I agree with Jesse, definitely that, that, that middle one. So I'm glad that that is um, a plan to put that in. Um, I also really like on the intersection on the other slide, the bump out um, at uh, Belmere and Belltown, um, because that there's a bus stop there and cars park way too close to the curb. So this is gonna help a lot for the kids that are getting off the bus there. So my, my question though is, um, and one other thing, I agree with Cheryl, I love the medium, but I am worried about upkeep because we have seen other medians in the city that don't get um, attention. Um, one thing also about Belltown Road is the parking there is not enforced. It's supposed to be one hour and there are cars there that are there all day, which is very frustrating. I am concerned. I wondered if you could do a bump out where the car repair place is because that line of sight is really, really tough. Um, and the, the car repair dealership parks their cars all the way up so they're blocking the sidewalk. Um, so seeing that, that, that's still a concern. I'm really worried about the line of sight there um, looking left. Okay. Um, so in terms of the median, you know, it's helpful because we actually have parks department staff right there maintaining the park. Um, and most of the medians are actually uh, maintained by the parks department. So we have crews stationed there already uh, to, make, to do maintenance. So um, in terms of like overall maintenance is less than, you know, let's say some median up in North Stanford five miles away from the nearest park. Um, hopefully that addresses some of the uh, maintenance concerns. Um, in terms of the um, the driveway cutoff, so we can't really eliminate the driveway um, since it's existing condition. Um, if people are parking on the sidewalk, that is a violation of city parking ordinance. Um, I would direct everyone in general to fix at Stanford for all citizen uh, service complaints. Um, but specifically, we do have ones for parking. If you do see people are parking for more than one hour on Belltown Road, um, you can definitely submit that. And we can put it on our radar too, and I'll talk with our parking operations foreman generally about enforcement over there. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm sorry, I believe you had one more question. Um, or it's the I line of sight by the car repair place. When you turn are going to turn left, it's really hard off of Burdick to see cars um, coming from that way going down um, towards Upland. Gotcha. Um, and you can see, uh, Luke, in the photograph, the aerial, there's a couple of cars parked. They're not on the sidewalk, and I'm not saying that they, I, I don't doubt that they do, but that makes it really difficult to see to your left because you're coming up a hill too. Right, we do have a city ordinance. You're not really allowed to have any thick structures within 25 feet of an intersecting street. Um, so that means usually no fences, no walls, no hedges. Um, I can see if vehicles are included in that. I don't know historically if they are. Usually my department's powers kind of um, drop off once you go onto private property, um, just in terms of what we can look at and enforce and maybe become more of a zoning issue if they're not staying, if they're, you know, they're parking right up onto the corner. Um, we can look into part of the nice thing, I guess, with the bump out is also pushes the cars away from the intersection a little bit. So it does help with the sight lines. We do think overall the, uh, the traffic calming measures on the road will help um, pulling out of Burdick Street just because people are driving at slower speeds towards the intersection. So that's one way we're also looking at trying to improve the um, sight lines as well. Another possible intervention to keep them from encroaching onto the sidewalk, you know, from the uh, repair shop is the possibility of adding some bollards along the backside of the sidewalk so that, I mean, it's not going to stop them from parking right up close to it, but it would stop them from encroaching upon the sidewalk itself. So that's a possibility as well. It is challenging. It is one of those more historical auto repair uses that are on corners that have curb cuts all on the, on each side of the corner, uh, but it is an existing condition. So I don't think we'll be able to close it um, as part of this. So um, Sandy, you have a question. I know there's a lot of questions in the chat, but once we're done with Sandy, um, I'll try to run through all the chat questions as well. Hi, great. Uh, thank you, you guys are doing great work. It's a lot, of, a lot of good thinking here and plans. I just had a really quick question. That is, you had mentioned to maximize parking up Burdick. Um, we're talking about one side of Burdick, right? Just want to make sure I heard that. Correct. It's the park yes, side. Yes, that is correct. Maximizing. Um, 
optimize really um, make it more consistent um, one of the things we're actually adding the parking south or not southwest of the parking lot so drop your kids off go right into the parking lot so you don't have to go all the way around the block um, so we're looking to formalize the parking locations because I know now it's it's not really a formalized parking locate um, parking really um, right. people are kind of parking on both sides of the street we've talked to the fire department too Belltown fire um, so we're incorporating their concerns and their designs as well into this. Uh, I know there's the um, senior center right on that road, and a lot of times they might have to respond there. So we want to make sure that the road is open. So that's why we're working on looking into defining the parking area better. And we're also limiting parking closer to Upland and um, Belltown. So it's less tight up there. And it's easier to pull um, pull out of the road over there. That's excellent. I think that's great. because There are a lot of people that come parking right up around the fire hydrant, you know, which is... Obviously, I wouldn't imagine the fire department mentioned that, but, <clears throat> and they pull and they have kids jump out there and on onto the ballpark. So it's just, that would be great. And right. and also, I know uh, Regan had mentioned this and a number of other people about the parking, um, the mechanic side of the street. And oftentimes there are ballpark um, folks that park there as well. So it's not always his vehicle. Sometimes it's, you know, from the baseball team. Mm -hmm. um, so. So I'm gonna run through the chat questions a little bit. So the question about funding, um, there are grants available. Our department is looking to try to um, use this project uh, for possible grant allocations, as you all are probably familiar with. There's a lot of money coming in right now for transportation dollars. There's a certain grant program that the state of Connecticut has that we've been successful in applying for money with in the past. Um, so we are actively looking uh, for grant pro programs. Uh, to help fund, at least on the roadway side. I can't speak so much on the park side, but on the roadway side, we are looking at uh, grants um, to try to fund this. As I mentioned, it's currently not funded at the city capital budget level, but as the grant um, notice of funding opportunities come out, we could definitely look into trying to fund it uh, through that way. Um, yep, got the question for Upland and Newfield. Again, it kind of goes back to the grants a little bit, is that the way most of the state grant funding formulas work, you can only fund certain types of roads with certain types of grants. So I wouldn't be able to fund the improvements on Belltown, Burdick, and Upland with the more standard, it's called LOTSIP um, grant because they're not busy enough roads in a way. Um, so there is another grant called Community Connectivity, which can fund these local roads, which actually I think this would be a great um, uh, project to do because it's really all about that grant specifically is all about pedestrian improvements and connecting the community which I really think this is so hopefully that kind of addresses the funding questions um, I'm not familiar with any public private partnership funding opportunities Aaron might be more familiar with that related to the park I know our department in general has been open and has done private public private partnerships in the past um, Meg has a question about the raised crosswalk so it's essentially um, basically like a speed hump as in a way, but it's a little um, smoother, I guess, and the, the top is flatter. So the whole where the, the white bars are, that's flat um, and there's ramps up on either side. So the crosswalk is even with the sidewalk along the entire way. So you don't have to go down to the road level and back up. Um, so that really helps um, prioritize pedestrian uh, right away and also safety, just general ADA accessibility and mobility. Meg, I hope that answers your question. Um, we're on the businesses at the commercial area aware of the changes to front door parking. Um, right now we don't have any, um, Aaron has met with the businesses and talked with the businesses or some of them at least. Um, we currently don't have any plans to meter the parking over here. Any changes to meters does have to get approved by the board of representatives. Um, you know, I think just the normal time restrictions will remain in effect. It is pretty, that's our city standard really to have these marked out parking stalls in commercial quarters that helps us define the parking a little bit better and also helps get, um, pulling in and out of the spaces a little bit better since there's just that higher level of turnover versus like on residential streets where people are going to be parked overnight. Um, so, yep. So you see the comment about the repair place visibility. You can certainly talk with them. Um, it is a little challenging just it is on private property. It's not like they're parking on the street close to um the uh, intersection. Um, so we're working on, we'll look into that. Bump out at Leonard's. So we do have a bump out in Leonard that's kind of framing um, the uh, coming uh, southbound on the road, trying to slow cars down there. But that's actually a new crosswalk we're adding there as well. And in terms of the grants, um, we can look into it. Um, usually grants are a little, um, you know, there's a minimum grant 
allocations that you need to have. And I don't know if the, you know, the things on Newfield are um, going to be included in that. As you many of you may be aware, we are working on a project further south on Strawberry Hill Avenue. Um, I mean, that's a completely separate project, separate area. We can look into other improvements on Newfield Avenue, but just again, based on, like we have to scope the project um, and using kind of the typology of the road and the citizen concerns, that's why we selected Belltown, Newfield, uh, sorry, excuse me, Belltown, Upland and Burdick. Um, but we can see what we can do on the Newfield side. Um, I'm certainly uh, understanding of your concerns. Again, I live on Newfield, I see what it's like. Um, and certainly want people to be able to access the park. I don't know necessarily what we can do on the grants. It's just a little different when you get onto those larger roads. Um, there's just different requirements at play with all the grant projects. Um, so same. I think, Luke, I think it'd probably be a good time to transition now. We've still got yeah, two exactly. more um, elements that we need to discuss. Uh, I think we, I mean, the, all the comments seem to be, um, I think you've covered them all. We've got a record of this. And I think that, you know, when we get to the next, meeting will certainly be addressing all of the comments in one way, shape or form. So if we can move on that way, I, there's still a lot to cover and I wanna make sure everybody still has a good opportunity to be able to speak to both the park improvements and the playground improvements as well. So Nate, why don't you uh, carry on to the next uh, topic. Great. And um. We intend to send out a survey after this to get additional feedback from you on the concepts and ideas. So if you think of something after the presentation, um, please fill out the survey and let us know. So onto the park improvements. Um, as you can see here, the existing conditions, for the major pieces of the park being the baseball field, the uh, facilities, including the restrooms and the pavilion, and the uh, basketball court, um, the major point of entry located with red arrows. Um, real quick, this is from the last presentation. Um, some elements of the baseball field, including the bleachers, the press box, the dugout, and the existing conditions as they are. Um, the park building uh, located here with a scoreboard on it with the restrooms inside, um, the pavilion, and the basketball court adjacent to those. The parking area is also part of the park study. I'm looking at enhancing that. Here's an image of the existing conditions. And so before we had the last um, presentation, we put out a survey and we got um, additional feedback after the presentation about um, what people like best about Barrett Park. And um, I think resoundingly what we heard was that people really appreciate that it's an open space, uh, green space. They love the nature feel, they love the community feel. They love that there's not too much packed into a small space that it feels comfortable. Um, and it has that natural feel like trees, rocks and grass and the walking path was a really big element that everyone really appreciated. Um, everyone really likes the pavilion, use the pavilion using for birthdays and special events. Also as called out as the multi-use area um, in the benches um, along this natural feel that are shaded and are great in the summer. And then the actual um, athletic facilities and the playground include the baseball field, the basketball field, and the playground, and everything gets used very uh, frequently and well, we believe. And what people want to improve, what we heard last time was a playground. Um, the playground was a really important feature, as well as um, the circulation through the site and um, wanting to get like a track or a path um, throughout the site in a circuit so people could walk around it, um, improving accessibility and crosswalks as we just discussed the roadways. Um, sidewalk improvements along the same idea, and then um, a ramp from Upland to Park so that people could actually, and you can see from the roadway, um, travel along that proposed sidewalk into the park uh, with a stroller or um, however it needed for uh, a better mobility getting into the park. Um, improving the amenities, the basic amenities being benches, seating areas, and picnic tables, um, table games or ping pongs, more fun amenities, um, interesting seating areas, hammocks, uh, you know grills, bike racks, additional trash cans, and recycling units, more trees to improve the shaded benches, and then the athletic facilities and the playground, repairing the basketball hoops, better bathroom facilities, better lighting and security, um, improvements to the scoreboard, repairing the stone walls, and then you know, new facilities, um, looking at pickleball, bocce, splash pads, exercise stations, community garden, a dog run, and gazebos. 
And finally, people things that people didn't care for, they wish there was less of it, what kind of improvements are really needed, um, the drainage and the puddles along the roadway. And then you know, there's some earlier concerns uh, in the park as well uh, that have been somewhat addressed, but there's still some lingering concerns, um, litter within the park, noise. Um, you know, some people felt that the dog park was not appropriate within the park. Uh, same thing with the splash pad. Um, the parking on Burdick Street, in its current condition, was very challenging, needing improvements on it, and um, you know, not wanting additional fenced-in areas and, and maintaining that open space that you can kind of move from one to the next, not feel like it's segmented or compartmentalized. And so, from this feedback, we really um, felt two concepts. And the way these concepts are are laid out is that we try to incorporate um, the more universal comments into one concept. And the second concept has seven or six um, alternative elements that we looked at and we studied and we wanted to get your feedback on and, on whether you thought they should be added or included. Um, so looking at the park, um, and number one, being developing a uh, universal playground uh, in this area here, and we'll get more into that as we um, talk about the playground. Uh, drainage improvements were needed in the park, uh, developing a path around the park. Um, so, you know, taking a central walk and if needed, expanding the width of it to accommodate additional usage and then making a loop of that central park going behind the baseball field to provide um, access to the bleachers as well as a concrete pad for the bleachers that would um, provide universal access going behind um, the press box and tying into the existing stairs right there, um, looping back around the backside, making that connection at Upland uh, so you can have access uh, from the bottom of uh, Upland into the park and coming down back onto the main strip. Um, additionally, the um, uh, just to, uh, sorry, the existing restroom facilities, um, providing a ramp to those facilities um, so that they were easily accessible, um, providing additional seating and um, uh, recycling units uh, throughout the area so that there's more um, interesting seating throughout. Um, and sp invasive species management. Um, we know along the um, back end of the park here, there was some invasive species noted and we would like to improve and eradicate those as needed. Um, improving the parking area. So, you know, the first concept shows um, maximizing parking um, for those baseball games that are very uh, heavily intended and adding a, a sidewalk within the parking area itself um, to provide that safe pedestrian connection coming into the park, as well as adding more trees within the parking area and um, lighting so that there's a feeling of safety within the, the um, parking area. Um, additionally, um, evaluating and renovating the existing buildings, um, improving the basketball court, those would be improvements to the um, asphalt as well as the uh, rims and hoops. Um, enhancing the baseball field. The baseball field enhancements would include new fence mesh along the um, backstop, um, bleachers with bleacher pads, as previously mentioned, updating the dugouts in the press box, um, inspecting the irrigation system uh, and updating that as needed, as well as providing continual lawn improvements to the baseball field. And, you know, we kind of quickly drew in the fact that you know, this is a baseball field, but also, you know, with the use of the camp out there right now, um, that it would also serve as a multi-use field for other um, you know, sports. And then um, preparing the scoreboard, uh, it's currently at the top of the restroom facilities, uh, rebuilding the wall along Burdick Street, um, adjusting the location of the entry sign, as Jason mentioned, and, uh, providing wayfinding into the area so that um, it faces the way when you're going into Burdick and adding that drop off as previously mentioned. And then uh, some other concepts um, that we thought of um, for the park include um, a more robust um, playground. And this playground would be a more nature-based playground, including a, um, a unstructured play area with rocks and um, different elements here as well as an adventure play area that would have some confirming of lawns. So we'll get more into that um, when we talk about the playground and a splash pad um, incorporated into it. 
additionally um, incorporating fitness areas along this main spine or central walk um, to be added to that circuit. Um, enhancing the neighborhood connection at Newfield Ave. So actually making this a new um, pedestrian connection from the bottom of Newfield coming into the park with additional seating areas and into the playground area. And as Bruce mentioned, the instruction play and the adventure play. And last, um, the idea of a dog park. And we looked at the dog park um, within the park and we didn't feel it was a very compatible usage um, given how many activities were already in the park, the strong desire to maintain um, that openness and not have it to be too fenced in. But we thought that you know, possibly if the community wanted to get behind the idea of converting some of this parking that's back here and sometimes underutilized um, into a dog park. And so we've um, added that to the concept as well. And um, last, not even numbered on this plan set because we were um, just kind of thinking about it you know, a couple of the days ago, um, replacing the bathroom facilities. Um, we know that the current bathroom facilities, the way they're laid out, is that you, you go into a um, kind of a narrow doorway uh, into a larger room, and then there's um, individual bathroom facilities for uh, males and females. Um, uh, in there, and it might not have the safest feeling to it. So to update the bathroom facilities might be to provide um, a single story facility that would have separate doors um, for uh, you know, men and women, and that those would have multiple store stalls in each one. Um, so you don't have to go into a room to uh, find another door within there. And so, um, those are our concepts for the um, overall park. And we'll be talking about the playground in more depth after this. I'd like to open up for comments and questions. I see uh, Jesse here says, uh, what type of community building elements do you see for, like a community message board? Um, again, with a uh, new restroom facility, we could definitely add a, a community message board onto that um, and have all those different elements for um, a type of um, you know, public improvement group for the park and um, providing feedback uh, with a message board, absolutely. All right, hearing um, no additional um, comments. Um, again, we'll have a survey where you can provide feedback on some of the options for concept two, and uh, we'll go into the playground. Oh, Fern. Yes, I'm sorry. Now, I just had uh, one comment about, about parking in the summer at the height of uh, little league season. Um, you know, there's there's generally a lot of uh, spillover on all of these uh, side streets, um, particularly Belmere and and um, and I'm wondering if if uh, you actually enhance the parking rather than taking it away with a, a part a dog park, although that could be an enticement. I don't know, but I, I really would hate to. I, I would love to open up the the parking area to be so people are directed not to parking on the streets, but to park into that lot there, so that um, you know the the people who stay um, and and look there are families coming from all the visiting towns to to Stamford to you know so it, it it's it gets a lot of traffic. Um, I don't know that we want to give up those spaces. I think we need to have those spaces um, preserved and, and just make it more attractive for people to park back there. That's my thought. Thank you. Yeah. And I would say that um, as part of that additional signage so that when you're coming up from Newfield on Burdick, it's really tough to tell that there's an access to a parking area there. Yeah. So right. I think, you know, part of moving the 
actual sign that's currently in the park itself is to sort of face motorists as they're coming up Burdick Street and be able to, with a series of signs ahead of where the parking area and left turn is, is to be able to have some signage that directs people into that area. Great. I think I think Jason kind of hit on it as well, you know, uh, and this would be something that I think when people become more accustomed to it is where the number 20 is, that's an opportunity for parents to drop off uh, kids that are going to the baseball or into the park and then be able to easily go into the parking lot itself right from that spot. That's great. Other questions? All right, well, let's move on. All right. Um, so the playground improvement plan, um, you know, the project goals as previously stated were to uh, develop a two to five and five to 12 play area with appropriate surfacing, um, making sure we have adequate grading and drainage and then site fencing if appropriate. And um, you know, during the last meeting, um, we reached out, we said, you know, what features would we like to see in the play area? And um, we asked if um, there was a certain style that people would like to see. And what we had heard so far is that people want to see climbing equipment, play structures, nature-based play, obstacle courses, lots of swings, um, areas for different ages, complex, interesting play, make sure the playground is ADA accessible, um, shade above the playground, um, you know, the benches, the splash pad, ADA surfacing, and the nature-themed setting is um, also like nature-based play. And so we came up with these two concepts, and I'll just quickly go into them before we start uh, showing the uh, elements, and we'll talk about these again uh, at the end of this. Um, the two concepts are to have a more um, traditional style playground that would have a series of small spaces that would have play equipment within them, and then uh, some type of um, circulation system that could be used for either walking or riding a scooter or a stroller throughout, um, with some trees and seating kind of tucked in between each of the areas. So, um, you know, idea almost similar to what's out there now, only it all be universally accessible and um, different materials um, of the individual spaces out there. And then the second concept of having this um, unstructured, you know, more expansive playground throughout the park um, with the more traditional equipment located in the central area, um, the idea for an option of a splash pad, uh, the unstructured play with rocks, which we can do with climbing activities, and then um, this adventure play that would include like a network of paths with hills that are rolling into um, different areas. And um, some equipment concepts to fit into these playgrounds was um, uh, a few, we have one um, modern design, uh, two uh, nature you know, inspired designs and then um, a wood design as well. Um, this first concept uh, is really a nature inspired design uh, showing some elements here would be a two to five play structure using natural um, colors. Um, and this would be a more durable option. Um, again, uh, natural elements incorporated for climbing, uh, different age play structures, um, possibly incorporating a series of um, uh, older like elements with climbing structures between them, um, nature based logs, and, uh, other elements um, incorporated. Um, you know, different pieces of equipment for different age groups, you know, spaced apart for different activities, um, nature-based slide elements, uh, climbing, as well as a uh, nature-inspired climbing structure here as well. And uh, even though you don't see it in this area, we also incorporate swings in this um, concept as well. The um, second playground concept, and this was developed uh, before we really uh, went through the concepts, but we incorporate this into a layout that was um, developed either in uh, one of these two concepts, not just a uh, rectangle here, but in this more modern concept, we'd have um, modern play equipment for five to 12, as well as, um, uh, sorry, two to five, as well as five to 12, accessible play elements within each of the concepts, but more modern styled of play elements, more modern styled climbing structure, um, different types of swings, including um, for younger ages, uh, a community, multi-swing, um, multiple children go out at once, 
more traditional swings and then a more like a rope climbing structure. And here, this third concept is another uh, nature styled um, concept, a little bit of modern elements in it as well. Um, and that would incorporate, again, uh, five to 12 play structure, um, natural um, looking or nat natural inspired um, elements, um, natural inspired swings in the area, um, more modern but nature based climbing structure, um, two to five play area, some more nature themed pieces of equipment here. And then the fourth concept. And so the, the first three um, are more of a longer durability, longer warranty playground. But we also looked at a wood structure. So this shows a, a black locust um, to wood um, playground feature. It would have very similar elements, including the two to five play area, the swings, the climbing structure, the five to 12 the benches, and uh, another wood structure right here. Um, but it wouldn't be quite as durable. And uh, some images of that, um, just to give you an idea of what those look like, the two to five a climbing structure, um, swings, as well as a five to 12 climbing structure. And that's what we have for concepts and we're hoping to get feedback from you on if there's a preference on a style um, through this meeting as well as later on in the survey. And so the answer to that question, Sandy, is yes, that's real wood. So I, I wanted to uh, just highlight two other parts of this. Um, and I can maybe even answer uh, Jesse's question. So Nate, if you go back to the first concept of the um, playground area. So part of what we were doing is working with a couple of different vendors and giving them some parameters of what we we're interested in having them be able to prepare for us as it related to the uh, some concepts. So in this concept, this was one that really, I think focused more on both uh, nature inspired play with the colors and the types of uh, components, uh, you know, introducing logs and rock formations. Um, so this is one vendor's concept of what that could look like. You know, having the uh, the log slide and the uh, sort of overly sized stump uh, climbing area, and Jesse, were you saying the photograph was this the one that uh, is, that you said the bottom right photograph was something that okay yeah yeah I was talking about exactly I was talking about like that picture if you want to zoom in so people can see closer it's like you can see a lot of um, bottom right though I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, it's, it really shows like a lot of open-ended play, which I think, um, I know we, we're talking about long lasting durable materials, but long lasting concepts are also very important. So, you know, like for example, a swing is a swing, a slide is a slide, but what you look at here in this bottom right picture, um, you know, teenagers could climb on this, two-year-olds could find their way in this, you know, it's, it's, it's much more open-ended. So concepts like this are great. And I think the concept to that point also, uh, it doesn't really force you to one kind of play. It really allows you to be more creative in your thinking about what that kind of play could be. So, you know, I'm, we're trying to stay away from the typical post and platform type of play pieces. Um, they still have somewhat of a place as an alternative, but not as the main component. So, the, the, the difference is generally where the vendors that we worked with. So the next one, option two, um, this vendor, uh, this was what they came up with. I would say it's, and Nate said this as well, it's, it's a far more traditional uh, approach. Um, there are some interesting play pieces. The one to the left uh, with the climber is kind of interesting. Uh, anything that you can get on, if you look to the left, Nate, if you could zoom into that piece over to the left side of the image. There are some interesting components to this. Um, and I think to a certain degree, it's worth mentioning there's some mixing and matching um, that could be done amongst all of the alternatives that we've been talking about. But sort of right in the bottom with the two kids on that rocking thing. I mean, that is an example to your point, Jesse, of really it's probably focused on one type of play, but it does have an interactive component to it. 
And anything that has a seesaw in it is always gets my attention, which is also in this one. They're not quite like the seesaws that I had, but they're not bad. And then the next option is yet another vendor, uh, same sort of set of criteria, and maybe it'd be good, Nate, to go to the photographs. Um, it, you know, very similar types of things. I really like the stump uh, and arm style swing. I like the mushroom walking surfaces. Um, I think that's, uh, I think it provides some unique opportunities as well. If you can go down to the next one, Nate, and then there's a lot of options and they're probably the best to go to the photographs. Uh, there's a lot of options in this realm is also, um, you can get sort of the same things, but you can also introduce like the climber to the upper right. Um, you know, you've got the post and platform. It's got a different look to it. Uh, there are even more, uh, there are many more looks that you can have with this. You can do like uh, standing seam or metal roof is, roofs on the structures. You can add in individual components. Uh, all of these vendors all have uh, elements where you can introduce sound types of things um, that, you know, there's a place where people can bang on a xylophone or you can bang on something that looks like a xylophone or beat on a drum. And so we could also introduce those kinds of things uh, to it as well as sort of the nature based element. So we wanted to be able to offer up at this point because we're talking about concepts and options, uh, a, a number of different approaches so that when we get your feedback, um, both tonight and through the survey, we can really start to hone in on um, a direction for which the next uh, meeting where we start, where we present um, sort of a, a master plan concept, we're honing in on one style at that point. Nate, if, uh, I think there's a way to introduce it. They also have a wide, I'm talking, speaking to Jesse's question about the splash pad. I mean, either one of those options could have a splash pad. Nate, could you go down to the two options? I think it's the next slide down. Either one of these could have a splash pad. I think the way I would look at incorporating it, there's certainly a, a proximity that would wanna be paid attention to. But so when we start to hone in on a, type of play structure, the character of it, I think we'd wanna pick up on some of that characteristics into the splash pad is one possibility, or you can introduce something completely different, but yet still visually compatible with um, the, uh, the play structure itself. I wanted to talk a little bit before we got to questions, a little bit more about uh, two things. One is getting in a little more detail on what we're calling the uh, adventure play and the unstructured play. And so the, to the right on this image to the right in the area of 24, what we are envisioning is uh, a series of paths that are broken up by berms, or I should say the paths break up the berms. So you've got all these little uh, hummocks or hill hills that provide places for kids to run up and down. In some places they'd be grass where they could roll down a hill. In other places, it might be stepping stone steps up to the top of the hill. Uh, there could be slides, there could be plantings, uh, a number of different things so that it's not necessarily, it's not a structured play element, but it allows a, a lot of different imagination to come up with the kind of play that you would implement there, but still incorporate a couple of things like, uh, Nate, if you can go to the next slide, you know, you might have things like um, stumps and that would be based into that. You can see a photograph up to the upper left, sort of a, a, a hill. This, this would be a series of them. Uh, and then you can see the slide with steps. So we could see that would be a possible elements to incorporate into the, the, that type of play. Nate, if you could go back to the previous um, slide. So the other part is to the left of the sort of structured play is what we're calling an unstructured play area where the existing boulders can be something that kids can use. Um, we could introduce uh, some, again, some of the stump ideas. Uh, Nate, if you can go down to the photographs, um, this also might be an opportunity to have 
an area where it's under the forest and there's sticks and things like that that the kids could make forts out of and the, and the like. And we might even introduce something like this pattern on the ground where it could be a maze or it could be something that's just more free flowing, meandering through the area that could be, um, again, open to the imagination of the kids using it on how they would want to do that. Maybe it's a train or maybe it's a, uh, you know, catch me if you can type of a kind of play. But that's what we're thinking about uh, for those two styles of play as well. And then I left um, surfacing for the end. I know that the surfacing is a, a big concern on the different types of materials. I think um, the, the, the folks have heard some of this already uh, about the, it's the city standard with going with the um, board in place uh, surfacing material. And there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Um, one of the main components is that it's very difficult to maintain the fall protection as well as ADA accessibility with a loose material. And you know, when I'm speaking of a loose material, I'm talking about the wood fiber, which is similar to what's out there today. Um, that material is, it, it takes a lot of effort to keep it in compliance with the manufacturer's warranty. I mean, the, if you were to read the man, manufacturer's warranty, they're very specific about the maintenance activities that need to take place. And so that requires raking out on almost a weekly basis, if not more, top dressing. And it's, it's a really difficult thing for communities to fund those kind of maintenance activities, especially given the unfortunate nature that um, maintenance is usually one of the things that gets cut out of the budget first. The beauty of the, the beauty of the, um, the, uh, the, the, adventure play or the uh, unstructured play is you don't have those kind of materials. And Jesse, I, your, your little note just popped down so I didn't get to read the whole thing. So hold on one second. No, uh, we're still, uh, I'm just saying the pros and the cons of these things. So um, I know that it's, as I said at the beginning of this, um, and Jesse's asking if this is a done deal with the play surface. It is the city's um, standard to go with the board in place. Um, but I also wanted to speak to um, some of the benefits of the, um, the, the wood chips as well, the, the fiber material. I mean, it does have a more organic characteristic to it. Um, it does have that uh, maybe um, more soft and approachable characteristic to it as well. So, I mean, there are some benefits, but the one thing that I will say, and I think Jesse, there's gonna be, there's no doubt that there's gonna be um, in the pros and the cons, then some of the things that in my research that I'm gonna say may direct towards one or the other, um, but I'm, I, am, I am leaving it open at this point. Uh, but on the, um, on the wood fiber mulch, there is um, the, the the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is really going away from the wood fiber mulch. It's not, a, it's not been written into law as it stands right now, but their big concern, and this comes from what um, in, the, in Massachusetts, they have an architectural access board. And the architectural access board is the group that is overseeing to make sure that projects are built with ADA accessibility and compliance in hand. And they have been starting to push back over the last few years against the fiber material because it doesn't, unless maintained almost on a daily basis, if not more, it doesn't provide the ADA accessibility. And they've, they've, all, they've gone into other things that I'm not sure I would necessarily agree with. One of them is the traversability of the material. Um, their big concern is when it gets humped up, then that becomes problematic with, um, with ADA accessibility. So the, a lot of the communities, uh, excuse me, the, the, a lot of the um, playgrounds that are going into Massachusetts are now more focused on the um, board in place. And I think the, one of the benefits of that to the board in place, as well as all the research that's gone on over the last, I'm gonna say um, some of the more important research has been taking place since say 2014 and 15 as it relates to 
uh, recycled rubber materials and where it's used. And the recycled material rubbers, and this is what the port in place is uh, partially constructed of, is a, of a concern because usually it's uh, shredded tires that then get uh, melted down to create a rubber surface. But uh, there was also a use of a shredded rubber material that was sort of like the um, fiber, but it was just a shredded rubber material. And that was really, um, it was really something that was uh, found to be quite toxic and very, very, I, I haven't seen it used in about five years. The port in place material is of a, a nature that there's two layers to it. Erin, do you have that sample? So you've got the bottom layer, the dark layer, and you've got the top half to three quarter inch layer on top. So the bottom layer, that thickness is at a various, it varies in how thick that is depending on the fall protection that you're trying to obtain. So the taller features that someone could fall from a higher zone would have a thicker layer of that material. And that material is of um, the recycled rubber material. The top half to three quarter inch is a virgin rubber material. It's a material that has been tested um, for, I will, for tested for the, um, uh, any toxins or anything like that. And it comes across, it doesn't, it doesn't have any of the toxins that are found to be within the rubber. But a lot of the manufacturers are also moving away from, um, I'll call it the dirty tire uh, recycled and are doing a lot of testing with a recycled rubber material that has a lot less of some of the known carcinogens and other, other chemicals in them that are, um, deemed to be very dangerous. And that we can, the approach that I would have is when we start to take the next step in looking at uh, focusing on these is actually getting into the conversation, uh, some folks that can speak about the testing about it or provide testing. And I've received some testing, but I'm still waiting for the other ones that I can provide to everybody and uh, intend on doing that as a follow on to this. Nate, if you could go back to option number one and then zoom in to the, say the, the, that, that log right there. Nope, that's, that's actually poured in place. This log, this is the fiber material. It's very similar to the material that you have out in the playground now. I think there is even a better photograph of the fiber material uh, in this, right? Yeah, right in the center there, bottom center. So that would be um, the fiber material. And the approach, Jesse, would be to show you that the port in place, for all intents and purposes, has less um, of those concerned chemicals than what you might find if you tested the soil surrounding play areas. So this is another opportunity for our pause, and we'd love to answer any questions or comments that you have with regard to the playground. So, Randy, I just want to say something real fast. Um, yes. I feel like everybody's asking their questions in the chat. And does everybody know how to raise their hand using the Zoom? Maybe we should just, I think you maybe might want to remind them how to do that so that you can have an equitable, everybody can have a question answered. Um, sure. Or it can go through the chat, but I just want to make sure everybody hey, can you tell them how to do that because I'm looking and hoping that there was a button that you'd push. <laughs> excuse me, that was for a chat and I'm not seeing it. So it's starting to ex go past my technical capabilities. Okay, so uh, I think the, on the bottom of the screen, there's some, uh, uh, on the right, bottom right, there's a, something called reactions. Oh um, yeah. And that's where you can, you can raise your hand. So Thanks. if anyone would, let, would prefer to do that as opposed to putting your um, question in the chat. So how do you, what, what would you like to do? Would you like to go through the chat or? Uh, we have one quite hand raised. Let's do that, right? Good idea. 
Let's do the hand raise to start. Okay. I mean, I think the chat's helpful for communication and background, but I think if we're going to answer questions or that, or even important comments, let's do it through the raising of the hand. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody gets to have a chance to talk. Yep, that's a good point. So, Nate, if who's raising their hand? Because <laughs> MT. Um, yes. Hi. Um, this is great, guys. I, it looks amazing. One thing that I wanted to ask: um, if we were if we were to go with option number two, um, would there be a possibility to kind of mix, right? Um, since you have kind of like all that nature with that um, unstructured play, would there be a possibility to then um, in the in the center area be a little bit more modern? I'm not sure how you know. I'm not a landscaper <laughs> designer, so I'm not sure how that would look, but. Um, yeah, I would like to know that. And I wanted to make a, a, a case for um, option number two, just because not all kids want to play in a, in a center area. There are kids also with like sensory issues that might find playing in, a, in, in an area with other kids a little bit um, overwhelming. So I hope that that's something that you guys can take into consideration and make sure that, you know, th I think the second option gives um, us parents the opportunity to be able to take our kids and and meet their needs when they have them. This is amazing. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, I think the short answer is there is the ability to mix and match concepts. Um, and so, you know, the, the benefit of at this point dealing with a number of different options is to be able to put a number of different ideas out there so that people can react to them. But yes, we can mix and match. Other questions? Jesse. Not sure if you're going to touch upon this, but what about a shade element? You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because yes, I was gonna to touch upon that. Nate, can you go to the plans? Yeah, that one, thank you. So you'll see in some of the images that were above that they're actually introducing kind of interesting ideas for shading and I'm going to go up to them in just a second but uh, one of the concerns of the port in place is that when it gets direct sun it can get warm and it, it, it is it's, it, I think that is of an issue uh, I think one of the benefits that we have is that the location of the for this site the location of the playground uh, adjacent to where those trees are that are along the property line provide some decent shade today. And what we're doing, you can see sort of the, the lighter green circles are proposed trees. So what we're looking at is incorporating or uh, augmenting the existing trees that provide decent shade out there with new trees to provide shade. Now, Nate, go up to say, we'll go just to one option one and we'll just go down because there are some interesting ideas on how they might do uh, shading. So upper left, Nate. So they have pieces that are built in to the play structures, like what you're seeing in this one. Uh, they'll also have freestanding elements that are uh, meant to provide shade over different play features that uh, thematically will go along with this. I've seen things such as um, large flowers, you know, like a big daisy that is really just a shade structure, but there's other things that they do thematically to, to provide shade on them. They can, if you can go down, I thought there was one other one that showed a shade area. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, the other thing that I've seen used oftentimes um, is uh, shade, like a shade structure or a shade cloth that might be like a sail that can provide seating as uh, next to benches. Again, I think the way that I would look at that um, would be to have those blended into the theme. Um, I will say sometimes uh, I've seen parks that actually will use them as like visual elements as well as shade elements so that if you're on the other side of the park and you've got this sort of view of almost like a, a shade scape that is kind of exciting and cool to look at and you know they could be of different colors and 
you know, you could be meeting a friend there and say, hey, I'm going to meet you under the purple striped uh, shade structure or something along that line. So I like to think of them as being used in a whimsical way, as well as being mixed in with um, uh, in a, uh, a thematic way. The one concern that I have on them um, is that if you have a, obviously the benches are typically fixed. And so depending on the time of day, you get more shade than others in time of year. You know, obviously we would probably pick the heat of the summer to really provide that shade area. But um, if, you, if you really want to try to expand the coverage, then you're talking about a larger structure. And the concern that I would have in this park is that a larger structure may start to feel a bit overwhelming. I'm not saying that it's an impossible thing to deal with, but I do think the shades um, sales can do a, a they get to be somewhat limited because of their size. And I think you just have to pay close attention to that. So real Other quick, hand, on the maintenance of uh, shade sales, so those would need to come down during the winter. Right, right. Other hands. Oh, Tara. Hi, thank you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm um, Board of Rep uh, Representative Gilbride in District 11. Um, sorry, I'm not on camera. It's been a particularly odd day, so I apologize for that. Um, questions, um, and thank you, Randy, and nice to see you and Aaron again. I just now spent a few hours with you guys between last night and today. <laughs> um, so question um, regarding services. Somebody had mentioned in the chat um, about the path that goes around in a circle, I believe it was Jeff, um, the path that goes around the whole park. Will that be concrete or is that a surface that's under discussion as well? So uh, the there, it, it, this, you bring up a good point and an interesting point that I was thinking about as we were going through transitioning from the transportation to the park uh, elements. So it's very likely, and I think a standard practice in loop, you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, that the sidewalk on the outside of the path would likely be a concrete material. Um, it does, you do have options to go to asphalt, but I don't know if there's a standard that the city uses for that. So number four and six. So number four. Those are the ones I'm talking about, not outside of okay. five. Yep. So yeah, that in, because I'm assuming that's like a runner's path, and I would assume that would be a softer material because so many people have issues with the pounding pavement. Pavement. I wouldn't call it a runner's path. I think it's a walking loop is the way I would characterize it. And well, um, I as a runner see it as a runner's path. <laughs> no, well, I mean, it could be. It could be. There's problems with that. Um, those rubberized surfaces are, um, you know, when, when you start thinking about the long term characteristics of them, they start to break down relatively quickly, you know, and by relatively quickly, I'm talking about in a eight to 12 year time frame. Whereas say, if it were an asphalt path, which is similar to what you have out there today or a concrete, it's a much more durable path. From the standpoint of running, we weren't thinking it was gonna be that wide, probably anywhere between uh, five to eight feet, depending on the nature of the use and how much we thought the use was gonna be. I mean, certainly a rubber surface could be considered and we can, we can um, next time talk about, um, you know, what the maintenance and costs on those are. When I'm speaking of the, the durability, it's not going from my recent research on the most up-to-date materials. The last time I did that, what for a track was for a school, um, four years ago, three or four years ago. Um, and so uh, you would think that it gets a lot more um, used under the school scenario. But when I was talking to the vendor then about doing it as a sort of a walking trail is that if it becomes really popular, then it would receive, and I would expect here it'd be likely the case, it would receive quite a lot of um, use. So I would need to get back to you on the, um, the long-term durability. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, are there any other options besides, you know, because I mean, obviously the rubber is a surface that's, you know, under some discussion now. And I mean, if you, you're saying that it is safe, I don't know if you have some 
um, anything you could share with us, um, just reports on that or where we could look for it or even links, then that maybe would make, you know, ease some of our concerns. But you're right, it is multi-use. It's, you know, people with strollers, it's runners, it's walkers, it's kids that are learning how to bike, ride their bicycles and are going to fall. So, right. you know, we want healthy, but we also want durable. Um, and then once again, you've got people running who's got runner knees because of the pounding pavement. So I personally don't know what that solution is. Is there a third option for any of this stuff? Or, or something that meets all of our demands, or am I asking for something that's uh, not possible? <laughs> it's, well, it's challenging. And the reason why it's challenging is if we're trying to both do ADA accessibility, have long-term yep. durability, and uh, deal with yeah, a costs lot. to a certain degree, the, the materials become limited. But I would say, you know, the ones that I would typically look at would be under the hardscape material would be, say, either concrete or asphalt. Um, the soft scape, more soft scape material would be a rubberized surface, and there's a couple of different levels of rubberized surfaces that you could use. Something that's a little bit in between, probably closer to the hardscape side, is like a uh, dense graded gravel or a compacted stone dust that um, is a little more natural looking. It's a little easier on the knees. It's not nearly as easy on the knees as, say, the rubberized surface but it's a little more forgiving than the concrete and the asphalt. So those are the ones that come to mind, but we'll definitely take a look at if there are any other opportunities or materials that really jump out and meet the ADA as well as um, other requirements. I'm just gonna chime okay. in here and just say, um, for the central walk here, kind of running through the center of the park, this will also act as a maintenance um, path as well. So smaller um, vehicles could use this um, either for uh, removing trash or you know um, fixing things within the playground or if a splash pad got developed or even accessing the pavilion or the um, restroom facility. And so the okay. uh, so Clara, are you all set or? No, 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 no. I was, I was listening. I appreciate it. Oh, no, no um, problem. Yeah, I just think learning about those options, you know, that of course are healthy and safe and natural and not, you know, gone are the days with the red and yellow playgrounds. And <laughs> so it's fantastic to see, you know, your options. I, of course, am partial towards one, but I am letting the constituents do whatever they want because <laughs> um, it's their park. Um, Okay. But yeah, I am great for now, and thanks for including us. And I hope to hear more from you guys. Um, yeah, somebody wrote, "We have enough asphalt. Let's keep the park green." So I, you know, I think that's the resounding message here. <laughs> We're trying our best. <laughs> and one of the other things that is a possibility, um, I somewhat hesitate to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up anyway, is looking at where we may be able to uh, buy away from ADA accessibility. And what I mean by that is um, if you've got a, a location where people are going from point A to point B, and I'm going to use, I'm going to give you an example. So under the concept with the pull-in park, uh, the parallel parking on Burdick Street, uh, and then you've got a walkway that doesn't exist today that we're proposing, which is to be able to get there uh, on number 15 so that you can gain access to those facilities and have ADA, is to have ADA access on those. But where we have, say, number four and number five, um, we could look at going to a softer material, uh, the, the dense graded gravel or stone dust, um, and be able to, well, actually not four, because that would provide ADA access from the pylon. But we might be able to find locations where there's a, um, a softer material that we could use on that. The trade-off there is then you have a couple of very varied materials, and maybe that looks a little funky, or maybe that looks good. Could I ask that you, I assume you're putting this deck on the um, on the project page that we have access to? Yeah, Aaron, you're shaking your head yes? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I happened to catch that. <laughs> um, any other information about the surfaces might be helpful for those that wanna take a deeper dive. So that's yep. great, so I'll take a look at this. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna have to hop off, but I appreciate it from my end and um, I'll- Thank you. Gaddy, do you have a question? Sorry, it's bedtime. So I'm in and out. I apologize. But maybe this has been discussed. 
previously while I wasn't listening in, but is a, is a viable, is a, is a water feature for Splashpad a, a viable proposition? Uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things that when we're considering alternatives, uh, before we bring it up to the public, I usually push this, the, the municipality that I'm working with to strongly consider it one way or the other because of the maintenance requirements that have, um, that are sort of inherent to it. But uh, it has been, it's been sort of discussed that this is an option that they wanted to put to the public. So we're putting it out there. So the, the short answer is yes, this is a, a viable option. I just right. want to say one thing real fast. It's like what, one of the other things that we're going to post besides this presentation on the project website is um, a review by the par the recreation staff and also the parks maintenance staff on these ideas. So you can sort of see the city perspective on some of these ideas. Carry on. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Does that answer your question, Gaddy? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, I guess the next step would be a placement and the look and feel of it. But yeah, you did answer my question. <laughs> okay, Fern. Yes, a couple of quick questions. Um, at the uh, corner of, of item number 12 up there, uh, so there are these, um, you know, precarious stairs down to uneven surface. I'm, I'm wondering what, um, what will be changed in that access to the park, that corner, because you know a lot of uh, a lot of people come from let's say you know Belltown Pizza or something they en enter at that point and uh, particularly um, having this this loop around the park which I think is a very nice idea but um, things get kind of congested somewhat uh, there and in front of the uh, behind the dugout and in front of those bleachers along Burdick. So I, is something being enhanced there or um, I don't know. And then the other thing I just wanted for clarification, the ADA access, will that be, uh, a, that's where there's like a very uneven kind of macadam uh, up into the park off of Burdick, like roughly at number 14. And now that's all gonna be graded correctly so that uh, it's ADA accessible. Those yeah, that, that area of number 14 is kind of rough and tumble today. Is like a stump of a huge tree that's there. The grade that is from the edge of Burdick into the park is really quite variable. Yeah. Um, so to be able to get that, that would be a, a decent undertaking as far as being able to remove some material so that we can level that out. But the intent would be to provide a much more accessible um, parking and sidewalk area that would allow people to easily get into the park in an uh, ADA compatible way. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then that, that corner number 12, is anything changing there or, or not likely? Uh, the, biggest, the biggest change is that the curb line goes out away from the park a little bit there. Uh, I think Luke and um, right. Jason talked about that, right. some rough adjustments there. You can see, maybe you can see just above the 12, the faint image of where the line is, that's the existing curb line. Right. So okay. we're, we're, we're trying to, at least in the upper level on the roadway side there, there's a little bit of uh, pulling the sidewalk away from where the current stairs right to the right of 12 go from the sidewalk down. But the intent would be to be able to have a sidewalk that goes all the way around so that we can provide, right. excuse me, universal access uh, yeah. in that area. But we're trying not to clutter it up too much because you're right, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? There's, there's been a, a question here for a while um, from Meg who has not been able to, um, her, her microphone isn't working. So since oh. it's been there for a while, I'd just like to read it for her. Oh, sure. Okay, so she says, I'm sorry, my microphone doesn't seem to be working. Going back to the general park area, would the city consider opening the park for dogs unleashed in the a.m. before nine. Other cities offer this, Rye, Greenwich, et cetera. It's well used by dog owners and would be more controlled. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm not sure um, how, it sounds like something that would be brought up before the Parks and Recreation Commission, I believe, um, since they, you know, they do rules and regulations. Um, 
I, I'm not sure how to, do you mind if I get back to you, Meg, after the, you know, after the meeting and, and do a little research and then I can actually put that on the project website if everybody else would like to know the answer to that as well. It's, it's an interesting point. I mean, one of the things that we struggled with was just looking at the park itself and it really, it, with some of the goals that the community uh, voiced and the desire to have compatible uses and try to eliminate incompatible uses was not having a dog park within the park itself. But I mean, the few times that I've been out there, they've been in uh, late morning and uh, later in the afternoon. I, I think each time that I've been there, I've seen somebody out there walking or running their dog. So it's a very interesting idea to maybe have um, sort of a, a window when they can do that before the real park activities kick in. So interesting. Jesse. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I would love if we could do something like that. Um, the only thing that I can imagine being an issue is um, there's also some very early morning exercise classes and stuff that goes on. I, I'm going to probably butcher it, but it looks like Tai Chi or something like, so I think we would just have to consider what currently goes on and maybe what might go on. I'm not sure how to do that since there's no like concrete fences within the park. So that's just a variable. And a, a question because this varies from community to community that I work in. Are people generally good about cleaning up after their dog? Generally. I think so. I'll just answer that. I think so. I mean, I, I yeah, absolutely. I think that the people who use the park, like we've been talking about, there isn't so much parking. Most people who use this park, unless they're here for a baseball game, are really neighbors. And I, I get a general sense of camaraderie and respect going on. We do have like the dog bags that are there. We can always add more. Um, and let's, you also answer my second question, Jesse, which is, um, something like that usually requires some kind of policing because, you know, people tend to push the boundaries of things a little bit, but it sounds like, you know, that final part of what you just said is that answers that question. Yeah, and I think, I mean, especially in the summer months, you have camp, start, there's a camp in this park, you have camp starting early in the morning at like 830. So that would have to be taken into high consideration. So, you know, it, it would be very clear, like, no dogs can be running around when there's 100 kids in the park. So I think at least in, from June to August, you have that happening. Right, right. Good point. Sean. Thanks, Randy. Um, um, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm one of the representatives for District 15, which is, um, which is where the park is located, but I, I also happen to be um, a sergeant with the police department. Um, being able to carve out of the ordinance uh, a, a specific spot, there, there, there's an ordinance that all dogs must be on leashes throughout the whole entire city, every single park. Um, there, you know, there's pockets like Mianus River Park. Um, Barrett Park in particular, where we see a lot of people that just don't comply and they've been issued infractions in the past, but it's, you know, I understand what people are saying. I could tell you from an enforcement standpoint, that's going to be something that's probably very difficult, almost to impossible to do, because if you do it for here, then everybody's going to want to do it. Um, and the problem that we run into when you have open space that's not contained is you can have the best behaved dog in the world. But what happens is, is when your well behaved dog wants to go up and socialize with somebody's leash dog that isn't well behaved, then there's going to be a problem. And we've responded over the years to numerous situations where you get into dog fights and things like that, because a dog that's not stable on a leash for a reason that gets approached by another dog is either going to feel that it has to defend itself or its owner and things like that. So I, I understand where everybody's coming from. And um, I've seen numerous times in the morning, almost every morning you see people in that park with their dogs, sometimes they're leashed, sometimes they're not. By the letter of the law, they're to be leashed all the time. But we just have a cultural, uh, there's certain places in the city where there's a, there's a cultural you know, exception to that. Um, I mean, the, the only other thing that, that I could possibly see is the, probably the, the least traversed area of the park because it's quite rocky is that um, southwest corner and, and, and perhaps putting a, a section over there that's fenced off that's dedicated to dogs. But other than that, um, you know, I can't, I can't see, I can't see that you'd, you'd have to amend the, the ordinance for the city and only particularly to this park. And that's not, I, I can't see that flying with everybody. 
And I, I don't mean to add that to rain on anybody's parade, but I'm just trying to be a little pragmatic with regard to the topic. When you say the you have to modify the city ordinance, is that for the leash part or the ability to have a time frame to have uh, allow dogs in the park? Um, you would have, well, with the leash part, um, with regard to trying to, to limit the park, a specific rule, to, you're going to have a specific rule to the park with regard to times that dogs are allowed and not allowed. Um, I don't think, I, I don't think you would have to, you would necessarily have to have an ordinance with regard to that. We'd have each park, um, particularly like beaches and stuff like that. We have varying closing times for certain parks within the city um that and and sometimes oh yeah we're, we're only down we're da actually down to one parks police officer we used to have uh you know a handful of them that would go around close the gates at certain times like that so right. there's varying there's varying different rules for each each park um but those are usually pertain to like specific closing times like that so perhaps perhaps you could do something like that like dogs are allowed between this time and that time but the leash thing is not is probably not, never gonna no, I just I, I was a little confused by that, but I do think to Aaron's point um, that I notion would want to go before the parks commission, but I just I was a little confused when you said that Sean so thank you for the clarification. No problem. Other hands. I saw a question in the chat about rebuilding the walls around the edges and yes, that would be part of the project. Hey, hey Randy, I, I, I have on, oh, I, I don't, there's somebody that says iPhone. I have another question, but I'll wait my turn. Okay, sure. I'll get right back to you. Uh, so iPhone hand. Yeah, hi everyone. This is uh, actually Carmine Tomas, representative uh, for District 15 as well with Sean. I just want to uh, add on to the um, discussion about dogs and leashing and, and whatnot. Um, I've been involved in training with dogs uh, a very long time. I have uh, a couple of dogs myself. Uh, I also see it to be problematic where um, you would allow uh, dogs to be off leash with other uh, guest residents walking their dogs on the leash, I could see the potential uh, uh, issue with that um, interaction between an unleashed uh, and a leashed dog as well. I've seen it at other locations. And I think that's why there's a, a general rule throughout the city uh, on why uh, dogs should be leashed. Um, so I just, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, I guess, sensitive topic, but I, I could understand um, why the leash law is in place. Um, and I just want to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, this has been addressed yet because I've been kind of jumping back between this and the fiscal meeting because Kevin Murray is actually presenting the budget for all his stuff. Um, but um, the, the drainage issue, um, I know in, the, in our meeting last night, with the Parks and Rec Committee on the Board of Reps, I mentioned that uh, southeast corner of the of the park. I mean, if you drive down, if you drive by there right now, there is yeah, right where the cursor is, and a little bit in, extending towards the uh, towards the playground, um, right where that yeah that cluster of trees that you got right there. Yep. So that area is still has a a major flooding issue. I mean, I drove by it. Uh, just a little while ago and there's um there's ponding um in the area and stuff like that so i don't know i know that's a whole another project in of its in of itself but i mean this is a massive undertaking that you guys are, are are about to you know that are you're trying to get done here and i was wondering if there's any true scope with regard to remediating that further i know it was some work has been done to it already but um it's just you know there's no other way to put it it's in it's inadequate as it stands right now no, that's it, and it was touched upon uh, throughout the presentation. But yes, um, I think any improvements within the playground area are going to require that the drainage issue be uh, resolved once and for all. Um, when we get to the next stage and we start honing in on preferred alternative and start producing 
cost estimates, I mean, that certainly is going to be an element that we want to pay uh, particular attention to. Um, the, interestingly, the the option for the adventure play, um, you know, part of when we were first conceptualizing that, uh, it kind of it started with the notion of raising that grade a little bit um, to try to help prevent some of the drainage uh, from ponding there, and then it just uh, well, to be honest, I was when I was working on that element of it. I was originally thinking of raising the grade and then I just said, well, what if we made all these berms? And then it just sort of evolved into the paths and what we presented. Um, so I think that it's gonna help out a lot. And if we weren't to do that, the, uh, the idea that 24 is highlighting, uh, we certainly would be doing a much greater uh, effort to try to take care of that water and get it into the drainage system. Okay, thank you very much. You don't wanna mix the two though, Jesse, if you can help it. If you can help it. Fern. Yeah, hi. Um, I recall when they tried to remediate the area um, a number of years ago that not only was it boggy, presumably some sort of an underground stream as we have spring all over Stanford, but uh, water was actually flooding out of the stone retaining wall up kind of near number six. So mm -hmm. even though they're way down, let's say, uh, you know, between numbers one and 24 here, the reality is that the, that the, um, the stream, if you will, extends way beyond this park. It's not just, you know, pooling of rain. So um, I don't know, probably the city has surveys and things, but it, it seemed to me to be a much bigger job that just wasn't fixed very well. Maybe it can't be, I don't know. But I, I happen to be standing in the park watching it shooting out of the stone wall and there's no drain there. It was just coming out of the wall. So, huh. Well, yeah. that's interesting and good to know. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, understanding what the source is, is has to be part of the first steps of coming up with a solution. Right. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, I yeah. think maybe Aaron will have to maybe round into the uh, engineering folks and see if they have any information about sources or things like that that might be useful. And then looking at some older maps and uh, historical photographs. Yeah, I can chime in a little bit on this too. In that, um, in the past, what we've seen is that the city has provided a um, French drain in this location here to catch some of that. Um, potentially high water table that you know gets exposed again as soon as you get past that retaining wall, and they've more most recently added a uh, French drain along this edge here that ties into a drain system. But you know, to everyone's point, that this is still tends to be an issue of, of wet area, as well as the uh, the playground as well. So when we incorporate these features, um, you know, some of this is going to be high water table. Some of it's going to be um, the soils. You know, I think we can improve it, but um, it's just going to be a challenge that I think is going to take a couple different attempts to, to really capture the greatest degree possible. But we would try to incorporate drainage into these elements um, to improve it the greatest degree possible. Fern, do you remember what time of year that was that that was happening? No, it was many years ago okay. before the, a lot of the work was done. So, yeah, sorry. I uh, no, no problem. To Nate's point, I, I, uh, part of what the issue is, I think, is likely to be the high water table. Um, but I was just wondering and thinking about engineering is that, you know, they may have some insight on some other sources that we might want to make sure we consider. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of, kind of to, you know, a little bit over to the left of the stairs coming down into the park. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that's hi historical perspective. Good to have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions, comments? So hearing none, what, what moving forward from this moment to um, the next meeting, uh, so we're, we're going to post this on the website. We're going to give it to Erin so she can post it on the website. 
And then um, we're going to formulate uh, and finalize a survey. Um, a question on that, it would probably be about a week or so before that survey is finalized. What's people's thoughts on how long we should leave that up? Is it, and I, I mean, I, I, the last one was left up, I think for a couple of months. And it's so- up, actually. I got a response. Randy, Randy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, cons I'm concerned about the survey in regard to, so there's a lot of people on the call right now who understand everything you're talking about, which has been incredible. I'm concerned that people will take this survey blindly and maybe not look at the recording or go through the PowerPoint, et cetera, and just take the survey. And you've shared so much amazing information and work here. So will this survey be more directed toward the people who are on the call or the community at large? And I think that whoever is answering it will answer it possibly differently. So how can we figure this part out? I uh, know. I think that's a, that's a fair point. Um, I, you know, if I were to ask our IT people, they would say something like, uh, you could set it up that you'd have to watch the recording before you could even get to the survey. Which, or that. you can ask a question, were you on the call? <laughs> well, no, no, yeah, that's and a then... good point. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You, then you could bypass it. But then if, I mean, how do you prove it? You know what I mean? Uh, I think I, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really good point. And I wonder if um, there's Survey a way. Should be available to at, at people who yeah. are not here at this meeting. And it depends on how you structure it. Um, yeah. I understand what Jesse's saying about context. However, you know, for one thing, we would like to know what style, what kind of elements, like there are certain things that you don't have to be here to, you did not have to be here to. I really like what Jeff just said. I think that's super important to qualify the questions, not simply, I mean, you began as well with, I, I think, you know, you showed us like different styles for the playground and you just said, here's option one, two, three, four. And then as you dug into it and qualified some of it, you know, we can pick and choose with different elements of each one. Like that actually helped me think more clearly about it. Um, so I think making sure that you really qualify the questions so people can make informed answers would be very valuable. And the, the, yeah, and what we were looking at, that's what I was thinking about for a survey question as it related to the four, is there might be one survey question that just says you can only pick one. Which one, just generally from a general characteristic, do you like? And then a follow-on question might be, uh, and we'd want to number the individual photographs, is to say, please indicate the five top elements in the photographs, the number of the five top elements. So to the point of being both specific, but also being able to expand on points, that might be the way that we could handle that. I just wanna add that um, the previous survey, I think we allowed uh, uh, users to be anonymous. For this one, we asked people to provide their name as well as their address so that we knew that the feedback was community driven. So don't think about that. Going back to the time frame, do we think um, like three to four weeks or longer or shorter? That sounds like enough time, doesn't it? Yeah, or shorter. <laughs> well, because I'm, I'm going to use that as sort of gauging when the next meeting is going to take place. So uh, oh, there was some really good input from tonight's meeting. Uh, we certainly got a little bit of homework to do, uh, getting this posted and having people's eyes on it. People will take the survey, people will send emails, all of that's great. Um, we'll wanna gather up all that information. So let's say we did it for two weeks and we probably need about a week and a half, two weeks to go through it all. And then a couple of weeks to prepare for the next meeting. So, you know, we're talking about, I should have kept track of that. Sounds like we're bumping up to the beginning of June um, and ideally, if we could have the next meeting meeting sometime in the beginning of June before people start um, having kids out of school and that type of thing, uh, I think that would be ideal. How does that sound to everybody? Okay. All right. Well, let's let's aim for that. Um, as Nate likes to always say. 
you can email us anytime. <laughs> and I say, use Nate's email address, not mine. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, I uh, really appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, Thank you this has for been coming, very everybody. informative. Thank you um, very much. And look forward to the survey coming out and then look forward to um, the notice for the next meeting and um, have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.